it was just like um, somebody kicking you in the gut, you know, like what? Cancer? An incurable cancer? Um, and then that's when the flood of fear, you know, came. It's like, I'm going to die. I'm too young to die. You know, why me? You know, all of those uh, range of emotions. Okay. You know, how am I going to tell my family? How, what do I say? Where do I even start to talk about this? I'm Valerie. I'm pretty down to earth person. Uh, I enjoy uh, really being in the great outdoors, of course, when it's warm, not when it's, you know, cold like that. Um, but uh, I enjoy spending time with my friends and family. Um, what I do is, uh, you know, work that's around myeloma and patient education and, and things of that nature. Um, I also enjoy, um, you know, doing things uh, at my church. I'm really involved in my church and uh, that brings me great joy. So thank you for sharing more about yourself. Um, I know that today we're really focused on this sudden change in your life that happened um, in, in 2014. Let's rewind. Valerie, can you share with us, when did you notice something was wrong? How did you first start to finally get to the doctor? Yeah, so it was uh, late 2014. I believe it was the, the first incident uh, happened. It was around uh, Thanksgiving time. I was uh, I had went back to school. I was studying um, and I was working on some homework on my computer and I got a nosebleed and I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, it's a nosebleed. I just, you know, stopped for a little bit, held my head back and, you know, kind of dissipated. And I got back to doing what I was doing. Um, well, it happened a couple of weeks later, the exact same thing. And, um, but this time it bled a little bit more, a little, little longer than uh, it was the first time. So still wasn't concerned. Uh, I, I thought it was the weather. I'd ask some of my friends, you know, what, what do you think's going on? And they're like, oh, it's changing seasons. And, you know, you are probably got uh, just some dry sinuses and stuff like that. And they told me to, you know, just put a little Vaseline in there. You'll be okay and keep going. Um, so I did that and, and I thought it was working. Uh, it wasn't until about a month later, um, I had got uh, sick with the flu uh, and I just felt tired, you know, just overly tired. And we'll go back. Um, at that time, I was I was working uh, full time. I work, was working in the HR field. Um, I was overly tired, you know, when it came to work, but I didn't think anything of it. I was, you know, working. I had was doing schoolwork, very involved in church. So I just talked it up to this, you know, that superwoman syndrome where you're just trying to do too much at one time. Um, but when I got the bout of flu, it just wouldn't go away. You know, I, I went to the doctor, I got the, you know, the Tamiflu and all the other things that, you know, you take and, you know, you should feel better. Um, and I remember it was uh, Christmas day. I couldn't even celebrate Christmas because I was in the bed sick. Uh, so I knew something was going on. That's when I decided I went over to my local CVS, you know, just, you know, um, and they gave me uh, more meds and said, hey, if, if you're not better by Monday, you know, go see your uh, primary care. And, and that's what I did. I went to see my primary care physician. I kind of told her what was going on with just the, the tiredness. Uh, and at that time, I did have uh, some back pain. It was nothing major. Um, I told her about the back pain and I told her, you know, about the nosebleeds. Um, she listened to what I had to say. She ran a complete panel of uh, blood work. Uh, and that blood work kind of came back showing a high um, protein. So immediately, you know, she sent me to see a uh, hematologist, oncologist. So that's how things kind of started there. At what point um, did you 
feel like, okay, something, okay, this is not normal, if you will. This is beyond the typical tests. Did, did it ever come to you before you got the diagnosis? So when I went, when my primary care suggested or referred me to the hematologist, um, I didn't think anything of that because I, I had been diagnosed with anemia, you know, many, many years ago, and I was taking iron supplements for that. So when she said, hey, I'm going to recommend you see a, a hematologist, I was okay. Didn't think anything of it. It wasn't until I went to see the hematologist and I found out that he was an oncologist as well. And I'm like, why would I need to see an oncologist? It was something that kind of snapped in my head at that moment that this is a little bit more than what I'm thinking, but I, I still didn't think, you know, anything too drastic of that. And, and I, I make this joke all the time, Stephanie, I tell people, I went to see my hematologist thinking I was going to get a prescription for iron and I came back with a cancer diagnosis, literally. And that's how it happened. But that's when I knew when, when she sent me to uh, the hematologist and I saw that oncologist tagged on with that, I knew something was not like it, it should have been. And so up until that point, really, it was, as far as Tesco, they did the complete lab work. Did you have anything else that had to happen or they knew from the blood work? So they were a little suspicious from the blood work. Um, they did the uh, full body. At this time, they were still doing the full body x-ray. So um, it was when they did the full body x-rays and they did the uh, bone marrow biopsy is when kind of all the pieces started to, to come together. Uh, now, I, I want to go back a little bit. Another uh, incident that let me know that it was a little bit more serious, um, when they asked me to come back, so I went and did blood work for the hematologist um, early one morning. And before I had gotten home, uh, the nurse had called and said, hey, we need you to come back. The doctor wants to do some more tests. And I'm like, well, what does he see? What is he expecting? And she wouldn't say anything. So that was another thing like, okay, something's going on because I haven't even gotten home and you wanted me to come back uh, right away there. So, um, and when I, when I came, well, she, she told me to come back because they needed to do a bone test. I didn't know what that was. Uh, little did I know that that was a bone marrow biopsy. So when I got there, I heard the term biopsy and I'm like, okay, this is really serious. Luckily, my friend had went with me. She, she said, I'm not going to let you go back over there by yourself. So, you know, I did have some support there with me when, when you know, things started to unfold. If you're allowed, it's helpful a lot of times to go to all these different kinds of appointments with somebody else, right? Definitely, definitely. I say a second set of ears, second set of hands. You want to have somebody there because... Um, I can remember, you know, the doctor was talking to me and, and I heard the words, you have myeloma, it's uncurable. I, I kind of went blank there for a minute. So it, it is always helpful to have someone there with you. Maybe ask some questions that you wouldn't even think to ask there. Let's zoom in on that moment, which is what I, no matter how many years go by, how much time passes, I think it's a very vivid memory for a lot of people, even if everything goes, you know, blank after. But what were you feeling the moments right before? And then when you heard those words, can you, can you bring us back to that moment for you? Yeah. Yeah. So the moment before was, it wasn't a shock. And the reason I say it wasn't a shock and because um, I had just learned about my chart. So, you know, when tests are done, you get the results. So I had been in my chart looking at every single test that had come back. What does this mean? If this is high, what does it mean? And, and this multiple myeloma kept coming up. And I'm like, what in the world is that? But I still put it out of my head because it was not something that I was going to have. You know, it was just whatever. Um, but it wasn't until that moment that I went into the office and was sitting there and, you know, heard those words that it was like, it was just like um, somebody kicking you in the gut, you know, like what cancer an incurable cancer. Um, and then that's when the flood of 
fear, you know, came because it's like, I'm going to die. I'm too young to die. You know, <laughs> why me? You know, all of those uh, range of emotions. Okay. You know, how am I going to tell my family? How, what do I say? Where do I even start to talk about this? You had your friend at that appointment too, or did you, were you by yourself? Mm -hmm. No, my friend was there. My friend Judy had went with me to that appointment and, and um, she's, she's a, a cancer survivor as well. So she, she was like, I'm not going to let you go by yourself. And that was very helpful to have someone who has heard those words before they, she knew exactly what I could have been feeling. So she was there to kind of help me keep it together. Um, how did you then, uh, it's hard to process anything in that moment, I'm sure, right? I can't remember. I didn't. Um, how, how did you break the news to your loved ones? Wow. It was hard. I didn't do it right away. It was a couple of weeks before I, because I didn't know what to say. I knew that they would have questions that I didn't even know where to look for answers or where to even begin. Um, it was a little easier because uh, my friends, uh, I don't live near my family, so it was a little difficult. You know, when my friends are seeing me every day and they want to know what's going on, it was easier for me to say, hey, this is what's going on. And, and I just left it at that because I didn't know what to expect. Uh, but with my family, it was it was hard because, like I said, I didn't know what to tell them. I didn't know the answers. Um, so that was one of the most difficult things uh, to do. But I finally got the nourish, the, the uh, courage, the nerves, whatever you want to call it, to really just say, hey, I've got multiple myeloma and this is what it is. And, you know, I don't know where it came from. I don't know anything. This is what I've got. This is what I'm looking at. I, I like that you you drew a boundary for yourself in that moment. You knew that you didn't have the answers. You knew they were going to have questions that it would maybe bring undue stress on top of what you were dealing with to, you know, tell them and then have all this, you know, all these questions floating around you. So I, I think that's a great example of how to protect yourself in that moment. Um, myeloma is is a, is is a cancer not many people hear about. Right? It's not like in the movies, you know, it's not everyday language. So for you, what was that learning curve? <laughs> um, it was tough. It was tough to begin with because, you know, it's still the shock of, that you have myeloma. Uh, but I learned very, very early. Um, I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about whatever this was that was invading my body. I'm like, well, if I can learn about it, I can at least try to get one step ahead, you know, uh, and I, I always say for me, it was this control thing, you know, um, I, I felt that the more I knew about it, at least I would have some control over it. That was really my mindset. So I went on this mission to find out whatever I could about the disease. And it just, it's stuck with me, actually, you know, this whole time. I, I'm always on a mission to find out a little bit more about the disease. So you felt the first sort of symptoms end of 2014. It was March 2015, you're diagnosed. So a few months later, at that point, most of us think, well, you diagnosed me with, with the cancer, so hit me with the treatment, right? Well, <laughs> but that's not exactly what happened. Tell, tell us what did happen. Yeah. So I was, uh, I got diagnosed and they wanted me to start treatment. I mean, like the next day. And I was like, okay, I guess I should go ahead and do this because I don't know I don't know what, you, what do you do when you get cancer? You want to get it out of you, right? Um, so I, I didn't start right away. I started, it was probably like uh, maybe a week or two later is when I went in. Uh, and I followed, I followed what they said because I didn't know. I didn't know all of the questions asked, what, you know, the right questions asked, I should say. Uh, so I kind of went along with what, you know, what the doctor says. I hadn't sought a second opinion. I didn't realize that I needed to see a specialist or anything like that. Um, so I had, uh, it was about three treatments and I just felt horrible, you know, um, at the urging of my family, they were like, you got to get a second opinion. You can't just, you know, you have to, you're, you're up there where all those doctors are. You have the ability to do that. So I decided to get a second opinion and 
is one of the best things that I could have ever done. I love that we're going to highlight this, especially when it comes to myeloma, which is more rare, right? Um, first of all, uh, what kind of a hospital were you at? You were at a local hospital at that point? I was at a local hospital. Um, I saw the hematologist, uh, you know, he, he treated other cancers as well. So um, I, I didn't realize that that was, you know, not the best thing for me, but it was just a local, you know, my local hospital, local uh, oncologist there. So do you remember the the treatment? You got three treatments. Was it what kind of, uh, what kind of key, was it chemo that you got? Yeah. So, so I got, um, they started me out with thalidomide, the okay, and everybody loves Dex. So that was my treatment regimen uh, to begin with. Uh, I didn't realize that was an older regimen that wasn't, you know, being used. Um, and uh, probably my doctor didn't realize that either. That's why he, you know, he gave me that. Uh, but that's what I started with. I did about three um, three weeks worth of that, three or four week cycles worth of that. And by that time, I was able to go uh, to this, to my second opinion to get that second opinion. Uh, it was at that time when I reported in for the second opinion, I was in really bad shape. Uh, at this point, I, I couldn't, I had to have a wheelchair, you know, to get from the car to the actual, um, you know, inside the uh, facility. And I knew something was wrong because that was not me at all. Even two months ago, I could still walk and I was coherent with it. You were in bad shape before, but going through this treatment, we know that, you know, going through cancer treatment is not, not fun by any stretch of the imagination, but you knew something else was going on. When you went to the second opinion, um, first of all, how did you find who was right for the second opinion? Was it a myeloma specialist? And what, what did you learn? Yeah, so so no, it wasn't a myeloma specialist right away. So I, where I live, there is a facility called the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, and that's where I went. Um, my everyone was like, hey, "You got to go there. That's all they do is cancer, cancer, cancer. You're going to be in good hands." You know, they they do specific. So I decided to go there, um, and it was at that time that I started learning a lot more about myeloma and the different treatments that were available. So you went to a special, a myeloma specialist there. Mm -hmm. Okay. What did you learn from the specialist about when you told him or her that you were getting this thalidomide, Velcade, Dex regimen, what was their reaction? What did you learn? Yeah. So, so when I went there, um, like I said, I was feeling really bad. Uh, I come to find out that my hemoglobin was like at a 4.6. So that's why I was feeling horrible. Um, but I learned when I went there that that was not, like I said, that was not the latest, you know, treatment uh, um, was standard of care, but, you know, there was something better out there. So I learned that there was something better out there. Um, I also learned about um, uh, stem cell transplant. You know, we talked uh, about stem cell transplant and what that looked like. And um, I learned a lot more than what my local oncologist had shared with me. I feel that with my local oncologist, it was a lack of communication um, because I was, I, I was, I remember this. I, I was told that, oh, you're going to do four cycles of this and then you're going to go for a stem cell transplant and then um, you, you may do a couple more cycles and then you're, you'll be back to, you know, your new normal. And I was like, oh, okay. So probably like maybe a year, things will be back to normal. Um, and that was not the case. You know, when I got to the uh, other doctor, they really explained, you know, what the stem cell process uh, entailed. And, you know, it's, there's no certain time. It's not like you're going to do this and you'll be back to your normal life. Um, uh, and, and at that time, it was like kind of eye opening because, I wanted to believe what I had been told. It sounded so much better and it, 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 it would have worked for me uh, if that were the case. But, you know, life's not like that. Looking back now, if you were to just summarize your feelings of knowing what you know now and thinking about the fact that you were you know, prescribed essentially this 
really old regimen, and this is your life, right? I mean, the reasons why why all these developments are happening is to increase life, quality of life, all those things. Like, what are those feelings for you thinking back on that? So I'm, at first I was a little angry. I'm like, well, how does this even happen? But then, you know, I, it, it was eye opening to me because it happens, you know, the, the, the doctor doesn't know they, they do what they know. So that was kind of like, uh, um, it helped me understand that, hey, there, there has to be more done when it comes to awareness and, you know, letting people know about uh, myeloma, um, letting people know that, hey, this is what myeloma is, but also letting them know what treatments are out there and, and what you should be getting and what, you know, probably not the best thing for you to be uh, receiving either. Thank you for sharing that, Valerie. Um, let's let's dive in a little bit to your actual treatment then too. So you talked about it. You would eventually get a transplant and go through all the therapy related to that. Um, what was the when? At what point did your specialist say, "Here's why we, we need to pursue this"? And yeah, talk to us about the preparation. Yeah. So so here's I want to I want to make sure that I share this because. I was disappointed when I found out I had did four cycles of, uh, you know, treatment, thinking that these four cycles was going to, you know, bring down the disease burden to where I could move forward with transplant. So at the end of my four cycles, I'm thinking, yes, it's transplant. Well, it didn't happen like that. You know, um, I I hadn't uh, eliminated enough of the cancer cells in order to move forward with that. So then comes the conversation of, we're going to need to do some more uh, therapy. We're going to need to continue the induction therapy. And that's when I found out about uh, myeloma clones. I, what's a clone? Never heard of a clone, you know, never heard of that until I was about six months in. Um, so I think it's those little things that if you know, then you can be better prepared. You know, I wasn't prepared to be told you can't go to transplant right now. It's so funny because I went and shaved my head. I was like, I'm going to shave it all off before it happens. And they're like, no, you, you can't. You're not ready for that yet. So I was disappointed. I was a little angry. I was a little just kind of bewildered. Like, what's happening now? Here's another gut punch. You know, can we just move on with it? How did you resolve that for yourself? You know, when you were feeling the most, whether it was angry or sad or everything combined where you thought, I was ready. I was, I have a plan. I'm going to shave my head before I have control of this. We're going to go in. And now I'm being told I can't. How did you move through that mentally, emotionally? Yeah. So it was that word control. It was really then that I realized that I'm not in control of this or anything else really it was that at that moment because I'm like well, I did all the things that I was supposed to do I you know I I got my knowledge I I I have no control so I I did those all of those feelings that I I was feeling I, I just sat with them I didn't try to push them away I just sat with them and said you got to deal with this you're going to have to deal with this and I just dealt with it you know, I had uh, my faith has play, played a very important role in this. You know, I had my prayer partners praying like, hey, this is what's going on. This is not how I thought it was going to plan. You know, I thought it was going to be. And um, so that helped me tremendously when it came to dealing with that. Um, and I, I sought some therapy because I knew I'm like, oh, this is I can't do this by myself. And it's not something that I can just pray away. I really needed some outside help. I needed somebody that was going to listen and just listen. You know, um, I I couldn't talk to my friends because they didn't understand. They just hadn't been there. They 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 didn't know. Um, So I sought therapy. And that was one of the best things that I could have done because uh, my therapist helped me, you know, through the process there. I'm always appreciative when people talk about, you know, they're able to see the therapy or the counseling because it is so important. It's important in life in general. And then when you're in trauma, you know, as something as traumatic as 
being told you have cancer and going through treatment. So thank you for highlighting the importance of that. Um, and, and in, in this time, especially, so you, you went through the induction therapy. What do you remember what it was by the way? Yeah. So I got switched to, uh, Revamid, uh, Velcade and Dex. So I did, um, for, for additional cycles of that, um, and it, it wasn't working anymore. So that's when I was switched over to, uh, Kyprolis, Homilis and Dex. And I had immediate response with that. And that's what really uh, got me ready for the transplant. Were there any major side effects for that regimen? Um, and, and how did you get through that? Yeah. Yeah. So with uh, when I switched from Revlimid to Pomelis, um, it took a little bit of getting used to because my body was like, oh, I don't think I like that. Uh, I had uh, major GI issues. You know, and most people don't have GI issues with the pomelis, but uh, that's something that I was kind of struggling with. Uh, and taking those in combination, I had um, shortness of breath uh, to where it kind of, it slowed me down. Um, now, I mean, I should say it slowed me down even further. Uh, and I was concerned, you know, there's the, the, the risk of uh, cardiac issues when you're taking a kyphosis. Uh, so I was concerned there. I was, I had even gotten afraid. I'm like, I don't want to take that because, you know, it may be doing something to my heart. I'm having shortness of breath already. Um, but, you know, they sent me to see a, a cardiologist uh, a couple of times just to make sure that everything was okay. Um, and that that is one of the side effects, you know, when it comes to uh, taking those drugs is shortness of breath. So I eventually adjusted to that. That's just part of the new normal. So I adjusted to it and kept going. With the GI issues, is it just speaking up, knowing what the options are to try and help? Because I know GI issues can be everything from diarrhea to constipation to nausea to vomiting. It's a lot of different things out there. I had just, for instance, in my chemo, really bad constipation. I mean, I've never felt that so painfully before. Um, and it was only until I you know, had to ask for the help of what can I take Sometimes it's useful just to get the message of speak up if you're feeling badly, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, I was very vocal, any kind of, uh, even if I thought it was a side effect, I would say something about it because I didn't know. I, I, you know, I looked at the list of everything that could happen, but I'm like, well, maybe this is something that had been reported. You know, it is possible there. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think maybe sometimes uh, people are maybe afraid to speak up because of embarrassment or it's like, well, I don't, I'll just deal with it. Don't suffer through, you know, there, there's things out there that can help you uh, get through. So take advantage of those things, utilize those things, communicate with your doctor. Um, I know a lot of people are not comfortable talking to their doctor. You know, talk to the uh, physician's assistant, talk with the nurse practitioner. Uh, that's what they're there for. And sometimes people just need to hear that modeled in their, you know, other people's stories to realize, oh, I can do that. Okay. Um, and actually I had forgotten to ask too the same question about side effects with the uh, Revlimid and the Velcade index. Was, was there anything there that was notable for you and guidance to others on how to get through them? Yeah. So uh, with the Velcade, um, I did have uh, some new neuropathy, uh, just in my toe area, though, to start with. Um, and, and my doctors would always ask, you know, every week when I would come in to get it, you know, are you feeling any numbness, tingling, or anything of that nature? And even if it was a small amount, I would make sure that I said something about it so they could do something uh, about it. Um, and that was very helpful. Uh, with the Velcade, you know, it's a sub Q, um, and I'm sure most people would have those little spots on their uh, abdominal area, wherever the shot was given. Uh, sometimes that could be painful. Um, and I would just tell them, you know, so they would, they could kind of guide me in what to do. Um, with the Revlimid, I, I think one of the first things that kind of scared me uh, when I was taking that is I woke up one morning and I was just itching. You know, it started as an itch. It was on my legs. And I was like, oh, my God, what did something bite me? What's, you know, a mosquito bite? And before the end of the day, it was just a full blown. I was just itching all over uncontrollably. 
And it was like, the more I scratched, the worse it got. It was just nothing that would take it away. Um, so, you know, I, I called the doctor and they, you know, called in a prescription that would help. Um, but people need to be aware of that. I wasn't, I didn't know that could happen. I was surprised because I'm like, what the heck is, and I'm, I'm you know, it was really bad. Going into the transplant, um, you know, what were you told in terms of expectation setting? And yeah, talk to us about how it was while you were um, trying to recover. Yeah, yeah. So going into the transplant, I was, you know, mm-hmm. told what I could expect. And I, I remember uh, people, I would go on, um, I, I used to follow the myeloma beak and it's not there anymore, but um, Pat Killensworth, I started following him and I listened to, you know, what he said. I got his um, book. He had a book about uh, stem cell transplant. I read the book and I'm like, I'm going to make sure I do everything that they say do. And it's, you know, follow the advice of your doctors and your nurses. They do this every single day. They can tell you, you know, how to prepare. So I kind of kind of listened to that and, and followed, you know, some of the uh, big names out there. Yay, like I used to follow Yay, like I'm like, OK, these people know what's going on. Um, and that helped me get through or, or helped me prepare for the transplant. Now, um, the week before the transplant, <laughs> this is so funny. I found out that my insurance was not going to cover the transplant where I wanted to do it. So there's another like, huh? What, what is going on? Um, so that was something else that had to be worked out. You know, when you're dealing with uh, those types of bumps in the road, um, eventually you got it taken care of though, but that was a very stressful time with just trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? If, if the insurance is not going to cover it here, what do I do? You know? I, I cannot believe it never ceases to amaze me how much is like put on the plate of a patient and, you know, care partners sometimes too, but where it's like, Hey, you're having to do a lot already just to get ready for the transplant. Now you have another curveball thrown saying, Oh wait, sorry. No, you can't do it over there. If you want it covered. Do you, first of all, just have any quick sort of summarized guidance for people in terms of were there resources that were helpful? How could you in such a stressful time figure out this insurance issue? Yeah. So I was working with uh, the stem cell transplant navigator at the hospital. Gosh, she was such a godsend because I didn't know what to do. Um, And I just knew that I did not need the type of stress that this was bringing on. So she came and she was like, hey, this happened. We're going to take care of it. Um, And she just knew the right things to do. You know, it was so funny because I had everything in place. You know, my family was coming out to spend some time with me. My friends had, uh, a couple of them had taken off work. They had taken vacation time to, you know, kind of be there for me. So when I heard this, I'm like, well, everything's in place. I, you, you can't just, it can't just not happen because, you know, it's going to affect other things. Um, but she helped me get it all worked out. Um, I just say, have somebody that's working on your behalf. Don't try to do it all by yourself. Stem Cell Transplant Navigator was excellent. Uh, My other friend, Karen, she she was excellent and, you know, making phone calls and doing things. So really, I, I didn't have to stress a lot because they made sure that, you know, things were taken care of. They took the pressure off of me, you know, and if you're one of those people that think you don't need help, you do need help. Um, if it's for nothing but for uh, someone to help you with paperwork, someone to make phone calls for you, someone to do that type of work for you. Um, and people want to, to do that, so, so let them. You know, when things like that come up, let them. 